Now we're going to go to the tribe of Issachar. And you know, there's a lot of history. You know, we can get a lot of history books and accounts. But we'll, we'll be here for hours going into that, man. But you got the main point, the main focus, mainly the scriptures. You got the main point. If you can't see that that's the tribe, talking about the tribe of Ephraim, then you're not, you're, your eyes are not open, all right? But like the Lord told the disciples, you ain't going to receive everything. He said, if you are able to receive it. All right? That's right. All right, now we're going to go, deal with the tribe of Issachar. And I got some, uh, a couple of clips on Issachar. Uh, the first scripture I want to go to is Genesis, the 49th chapter, the 14th and the 15th verse. Genesis chapter 49, verse uh, 14. Issachar is a strong ass couched down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant. And bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Read that again, nice and slow. It says, Issachar is a strong ass, I'm sorry. Issachar is a strong ass couched down between two burdens. Now if you go to a travel agency and you want to go to Mexico... You go inside that travel agency. I don't know if they do it today. Because I went to Mexico back. I went to Mexico City back in uh, 87. Um, if you go into the travel agency. Especially like I said. You have travel agencies that deal with. You can go to Europe. You can go to China. You can go to Mexico. You can go Puerto R to Puerto Rico. But now. When, when I went to Mexico. The travel agency, agency that I dealt with. With my woman was uh, mainly my woman dealt with, with, with the preparations and all that, okay? Because she had went to school down there. So she knew how to speak Spanish. And so she was a Gadite, but she knew how to speak uh, fluent Spanish and everything. And she had been, she had lived in Mexico for a while going to school. So she talked me into going to Mexico. So I said, well, look, if I'm going, I'm going to bring literature, you know? And that's exactly what I did, you know? And uh, then people took to this truth, man. When, when you told them that they were Issachar, they were, they were one of the tribes of Israel, they was, when you give them a literature, they would just stop whatever they were doing. They would stop, even children, they would stop and read, and then they would ask you questions about the lit literature if they didn't understand certain things. I was on a train, they called the Metro, and I had passed out literature to everybody on that train, right? And when I got off at the, net, the stop, I think more than half, about 60% of the people got off and surrounded me and they were asking me all kind of questions about this information. So they took to it, man. Okay? So, so, so now, when you, now when you go to that um, travel agency, before you go to Mexico, you might see posters up. You know, if you're going to go to Spain, you might see posters of a mountain or some famous castle. Or you might see a, uh, you, you, you see a post of Mexico, and sometimes you'll see uh, an ass or a donkey with two burdens over the uh, donkey's uh, back. So that's what we're reading about right now. So let's read that again. Issachar is a strong ass couched down between two burdens, and he saw that rest was good. And he saw that rest was good. Now we didn't go and look up. Uh, the fiesta, the siesta, the siesta is when you would uh, work early in the morning, and I believe it's three o'clock. Now, there's, there's this mechanic I deal with with his fam family. They're from Mexico. They can be working on your engine, man, and as soon as three o'clock hits, they'll stop everything, man, and they'll just sit down for an hour and eat and just lay back and relax. It's like there's a spurt on them. And then if you can say, could you, no, 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 you wait till four o'clock. You got to wait. Yeah. All right. That's how they are. Because you had this thing where they bust their ass. By the way, Issachar means he is hired. Now, the way to pron pronounce it is not uh, Yashaka, it's Yashashka. Yashashka. Okay. Yashashka means uh, uh, he uh, he, the Yah, he hired or he is hired. That's what it means. Because he became a servant servant to tribute. Because, let me tell you something, I can't work the hours that Issachar can work, man. They work 18, 19 hours like it's nothing. 
Because it's in their DNA. Because the Most High made them that way. That's why, hence, they got the name Is uh, Issachar, Yashashka, which, which is an omen omen. He is hired. Okay? Read that again. And he saw that rest was good. So read it from the top. Okay. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant. The land is pleasant, man. When I went down there, the, the, the smell of the land, you had palm trees down there. You had different type of trees and vegetables down there. You know, it was a whole different uh, uh, spirit. Go ahead. And bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. A servant under tribute meaning tribute means uh, uh, work. That's what you, the Spanish word uh, 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 tra uh, uh, trabajando, which means work. Okay, when you pay tribute to somebody, that's that word work. You work for somebody. Okay, I right, go ahead. That was it on that. That was it on that. All right, now let's go from there to the book of Deuteronomy, the thirty-third chapter and the eighteenth verse. I right, go ahead. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 18. And of Zebulon he said, Rejoice Zebulon in thy going out and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountains. There they shall uh, uh, offer sacrifices of righteousness for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of the treasures hid in the sand. Read that last part again in the middle. Okay. It says, There they shall offer... Read the part where it goes in Issachar. Okay. It says, uh, and, 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 and Issachar in the tents, and, and Issachar in thy tents, they shall call the people unto the mountain, there they shall uh, offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seed. Right, the part where they said about sacrifices of righteousness is a lot of them know that they're Israelites. You run into enough of Mexicans, they'll tell you they know that they're Israelites. Now the reason why they know that they were Israelites, because I had the article, but I, didn't have, I don't have time to really bring it out, but you can look it up for yourself, that during the time of the conquistadors, you had a lot of Spaniards and Moors, which were Israelites, come to Mexico. And then they would marry Mexican women, they would intermarry with them, and they would bring their custom of uh, uh, being an Israelite or the Torah. So you had mixed families where you had uh, Issachar marrying among the real Israelites and some so-called Jews. So they were actually praying to the Most High. They were following Torah. Right. Now years ago, back when Yaqua was still living, I'm talking about back in the early 80s, he actually had an article where well, it was showing you that there was a group of Issacharites that actually take out the Torah and they do the Torah blessing and they keep the Passover. But I was trying to find uh, that article and I couldn't find it. It's an old article. But if you do enough research, which I have found the article on the web, it tells you back in the 1500s and the 1600s, you had a lot of Israelites from Spain that came over here to the uh, Americas, mainly uh, 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 Mexico. All right? All right, go ahead. It says, uh, And Issachar in thy tents, then, shall, then they shall call the people unto the mountains, there they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas, and of the treasures hid in the sand. And of the treasures hid in the sand. Now what treasure is hid in the sand? That Esau had known about this back in the 1800s? I'm going to let the brother read this art, part of this article. Yeah, this is from a web page entitled Oil. It says, although explorers drilled Mexico's first petroleum well in 1869, oil was not discovered until the turn of the 20th century. Commercial production crude oil began in 1901. By 1910, pros prospectors had began to define the Panuco, Ibano, and Faja de Oro fields located near the central Gulf of Mexico coast town of Tuxpan and uh, systematic explorations by foreign companies came to supersede the uncoordinated efforts of speculative prospectors. 
Mexico began to export oil in 1911. Now there's a point down here in the third paragraph. I'll just read it. It says, uh, Mexico was second only to the United States in petroleum output and led the world in oil exports. By the, 19, by the early 1930s, however, output had fallen to just 20% of its 1921 level as a consequence of worldwide economic depression. Yeah, so the oil's still still down there, man. Now you know down there in the Gulf of Mexico, they cracked that the, the bottom of the sea right there, and they can't stop the oil. They wanted oil, now they're getting too much damn oil. All right, they want it, so they got it. You got some more? Yeah. Um, reading on further, it says Mexico's oil. Output expanded at an average annual rate of 6% between 1938 and 1971. Production increased from 44 million barrels in 1938 to 78 million barrels in 1951. Domestic demand progressively exceeded output, and in 1957, Mexico became a net importer of petroleum products. Production rose to 177 million barrels by 1971 with the exploitation of new oil fields in the isthmus of Tehuantepec. So that's the point. That's right. You got some? Yeah, this is uh, Genesis chapter 30, verse 14. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? And wouldest thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's ma uh, mandrakes. And Jacob came out of the field in the, in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him, and said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee <laughs> with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night, and the Most High hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, The Most High hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to, uh, to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. So that's that, that goes back to uh, the um, um, uh, omen, omen omen, uh, name sign. So his name was called, he is hired, and guess what? That was in the spirit, man. Okay. Now, do we, do we read Deuteronomy 33? Okay, so we read that. Now let's go from there to the book of 1 Chronicles, the 12th chapter, and the 32nd sec, uh, verse. Now this is an important scripture because they came out with a movie called uh, 2012, right? And it's based off of the... Uh, now get that ready on the tab, brother. You got the first tab, which is, it says something about Maya... And then the second tab goes into it, it follows suit, all right? And there's one of them tab, and there's one of them tabs where it goes into the calendar. I think it's the Mayan calendar, the Mayan, the first one where it goes into the Mayan. It tells you about the calendar and so forth. It's down in there. You, you just got to find it, all right? But anyway, the reason why they made that movie, or when they made that movie, they based it off of the prophecy of the Issacharites. The Mayans and the Aztecs. And you know what? The Mayans and the Aztecs are right. It, but it doesn't mean that this man is going to go down in 2012. But, but this man may go down in the next couple of months. Yep. In the next six months. In the middle of uh, 2011. It could happen in 2012 or a little beyond 2012. But we're right in that time. In other words, we're not going to be here for another 50 years. You see the tension going on around the world. Okay? Every, everything's in place for, for, for this man to crumble down, man. You see his bridges going down. He don't have no money. He can't build anything back, man. His society's going down slowly, but then the Mossad's going to speed it up by causing him to go over there to Iran and Russia getting involved, and then they're going to have that nuclear uh, war. They're going to have that third world's war. So we're right in that time. So... Anybody that calls themselves being in the Bible that can't see that, then you got, there's something wrong with you. Okay? I right, go ahead, Otto. 
First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Read that again, nice and slow. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Now go from there to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, and the 14th verse. I'm sorry, the 14th and the 15th verse. All right, go ahead. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And the Most High and the power said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Read that again slow. And, and, God, and the God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. The lights in the firmament of the heavens is the sun, the moon, a greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So that's what we're talking about. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Go ahead. To divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons. Let them be for signs. What's a sign? An omen. Like I think, I don't know if, if it's a day or tomorrow. They had it on the news where they're going to have another, uh, I think it's a solar eclipse. But it can only be viewed in Hawaii. That's a sign. That's a sign that something's getting ready to come. When, when Moses, before he was born, don't you know the uh, magis, the stargazers of Egypt? They knew that there was going to be a deliver, deliverer because they saw the stars, the formation of the stars. And they said that Coltep, which is uh, Haley's Comet, came through and they said a deliverer is coming. Remember before the Lord was born, or when he was born, there was a star that Herod uh, in, um, uh, kept in contact with the, the company of wise men. About the star, you can read it yourself in the New Test. Read it for yourself in the New Testament, and they knew that there was going to be a Messiah, the the uh, prophecy of the King of Israel to take down Esau. Pursuant to uh, Numbers, uh, the twenty fourth chapter, because it said a star shall come out of Jacob. So they knew about the stars that the certain formation of stars or uh, uh, comets. Or eclipses. When the Lord was put on the cross, was not was not there darkness for the space of I believe it was three hours, and it was what three o'clock? I believe it was from three o'clock to six o'clock, because they said it was the ninth hour, right? Six in the morning is the first hour, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, um, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two. Actually, I mean, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. The ninth hour of the day was around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He was already on the cross. And what happened? There was darkness. Why? Because there was an eclipse. That was another sign. All right, go ahead. Um, this is the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 43, verse uh, eight, uh, 6. He made the moon... Also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of for a declaration of times. Now go back to Chronicles and then go back to the Apocrypha. Uh, this is uh, First Chronicles 12 and 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. So what does that mean by the times? It means the, the, they can look up into the heavens. And they can say, this is what's going to happen. When Israel went out to war, they're going to win the battle. Or no, don't fight on this day. Wait two weeks later. The high holy days. But in the case of Issachar, they looked at the stars and the Most High gave them the spirit to know that something major was going to happen. That's why everybody around the world points to uh, 2012 coming from the Mayans and the Aztecs. All right? Go ahead. Uh, Ecclesiastes 43 and, and 6. He made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world. From the moon is the sign of feast, a light that decreaseth, decreaseth in her perfection. 
The month is called after her name, increasing wonderfully in her changing, being an instrument of the armies above, shining in the firmament of heaven. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of photos. This is on the Tio Tihukan webpage from uh, Wikipedia. It says, View of the Avenue of the Dead and the Pyramid of the Sun from the Pyramid of the Moon. And then when you scroll down, there's another picture. It says, uh, and the view in the other direction from the Pyramid of the Sun. Should I go to Maya? Go to Maya. All right. Now, I'm going to go to Maya. I had, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got something of um, interest to you, too, to tie into what you uh, just read, dealing with the observations. The tribe of Issachar, also known as the Mayans, and their observation of the sun and the moon and, and whatnot. This is under Maya in the Wikipedia. It's under Notable Constructions. It says, Observatories. The Maya were keen astronomers and had mapped out the phases of celestial objects, especially the moon and Venus. Many temples have doorways and other features align into celestial events. Uh, that just backed up what you said about how they could look up in the skies and know certain events were coming. Round tables often dedicated to Kukulkan and perhaps those most often described as observatories by modern... Can I say something? Yep. Kukulkan and Kwatsukwatl, the, the, that's supposed to be Yahweh Shai. Right. Because Yahweh Shai... Uh, came to the Americas after he left uh, um, uh, the, the apostles, okay? Yeah, reading on, it says, Many temples have doorways and other features aligning to celestial events. Round temples often dedicated to Kul Kul Khan are perhaps those most often described as ob observatories by modern ruined tour guides. But there is no evidence that they were so used exclusively, and temple pyramids of other shapes may well have been used for observation as well. Now, if we scroll down, we go to mathematics. Um, this is dealing with the calendar. It says, in common with the other Mesoamerican civilizations, the Maya had measured the length of the solar year to a high degree of accuracy far more accurately than that used in Europe as the basis of the Gregorian calendar. Uh, they did not use this figure for the length of, a, of, of year in their calendars. However, their calendars or the calendars they used were crude, being based on a year length of exactly 365 days, which means that the calendar falls out of step with the seasons by one day every four years. Uh, by comparison, the Julian calendar used in Europe for, from Roman times until about 16th century accumulated an error of only one day every 128 years. Um, that's, that's pretty much it on that. Yeah, so it's telling you that Esau knows that um, Issachar, they were heavy into l dealing with the uh, calendar, which in a calendar has months. The word months goes back to moon. So they were able to look into the heavens and uh, see uh, actual prophecy in the making. All right? All right, go ahead. Yeah, one more thing I had written down. It's under religion on the same Maya page. It says, the Maya underworld is reached through caves and ball courts. It was thought to be dominated by the aged Mayan gods of death and putrif putrefaction. The sun... Kinich Ahu and Izama, an aged god, dominated the Mayan idea of the sky. Uh, another aged god, God El, was one of the major deities of the underworld. The night sky was considered a window showing all supernatural doings. The Maya configured constellations of gods and places saw the unfolding of narratives in their seasonal movements 
and believed that the intersection of all possible worlds was in the night sky. So that's right. Well, uh, calculus. That um, there's a movie called um, I believe it's called Stand and Deliver, with with Edwin James almost, and it was um, based upon a true uh, story of these Mexican kids in L.A. that he taught them calculus and they couldn't get it at first because it was advanced uh, math. And he said, "Come on, that says." He said, "This is in your blood, your the the Aztecs and the Mayans, man. They used to do this, man." And then he said, uh, he said, don't you know that the, the, the asked his people, the Mayans, they understood the concept of a, a, a negative number. All right. He said Esau didn't even understand what a negative number is. Like you got minus five, minus five plus two would be uh, minus three. If you understand positive numbers and negative numbers. All right. So that goes right back to the scriptures. Okay? You got anything else? Because I want to bring this clip out. Go ahead. John chapter 10 verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now that's talking about the Lord was telling them that he's going to go. Uh, he's going to leave them and he's going to go to the other side of the world. That's what the Mormons preach about. That how the uh, Messiah came on this side of the world to the Americas and spoke to the uh, Gadites and the Issacharites and the other tribes. And he told them that he was going to come back. Alright? So the Mormons know that much. Now I want to go to this clip right here. And this is what Esau has to say about the whole Mayan uh, calendar and so forth, 2012. Twenty-one is the day, December 21st, 2012. Can you imagine going out perhaps early in the morning on that date, looking up and seeing a large, fiery, tumbling thing headed straight at Earth? Can you imagine that? We'll ask why the Mayans picked that particular date in a moment. I've always baited myself about the end of the Mayan calendar, figuring a couple of Mayans were sitting around one said to the other, I've had it with this calendar crap, that's it. And that's when they stopped. They just got sick of making calendars. I, I don't know. But here we have a date, 21 December 2012, which could be uh, the end of all, perhaps. Uh, why that date? On what do you believe they might have based that? I'm going to ask how the Mayans might have known to pick that specific date, 20, 21 December 2012, how did they know? We'll be right back. You believe all this is a recurring cycle of destruction, yes? I think it's a, I think we, we have to be open to the possibility that it's a recurring cycle of destruction because that's precisely what the ancient myths say, that there is some dark danger that visits the earth periodically uh, over long periods of history. It may go away for thousands and thousands of years. It may be completely forgotten. Uh, it, 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 it may be something that people never, ever think about. But then, uh, like a grim avenger, it comes back. It returns. To, to strike us down. People never ever think about but then, uh, like a grim avenger, it comes back, it returns to, to strike us down uh, again. And um, there, seems to be, there seems to be some kind of cycle uh, operating which, which perhaps we don't, we don't fully understand. Um, and, and I suppose the, the alarming prospect and the one that, that should focus our minds and that we should consider seriously uh, is, that, uh, is that this cyclical cataclysm spoken of in the ancient myths and in the traditions just might uh, return in our own time. We should learn the lessons of history, that we should be aware that, that uh, what struck our ancestors down may return to strike us again today. We could indeed be facing the return. Um, all we have are the memories and the traditions and perhaps the warnings that have been passed down to us by ancient civilizations. And there's no doubt in my mind, very clearly ringing out like a bell, is a warning coming down to us from the past. And Do you think one of those warnings was issued by the Mayans?
Yes, I do. I think the uh, the, the, Ma- the Mayan calendar is extremely interesting uh, in this respect, uh, and the Mayan calendar does, of course, contain a prophecy which could be interpreted as a prophecy, literally, of the end of the world uh, in in our time. Certainly, of the end of civilization as we know it, and very specific dates, uh, and the date the Maya put on it, in translated into our calendar, is the 21st of December. 2012, as, as of course is, is very widely known. I think, uh, I think many people in the world today are aware of this ancient warning and slightly spooked by it and rightly concerned uh, by what it might mean. Now, it's, it's not as simple as that. The, the, the Mayan calendar and the ideas that lie behind it are extremely complicated. The Maya were extraordinarily accurate and precise observers of the heavens. Uh, and uh, that they had a very uh, clear uh, knowledge and understanding of time and the way that the passage of time uh, affects the positions of the stars in the heavens and, in particular, the positions of those stars uh, lying in the background against the rising point of the sun on the horizon Mm -hmm. on particular days of the year. Uh, and what happens uh, on 21 December 2012, and in, in fact, really, as John Major Jenkins points out, we're looking more at a window here rather than a very uh, specific and exact moment, a window of about 40 years. Um, now, I think what's going on here is that the Maya are not, not saying that that in itself causes the disaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they're saying that that is the marker by which we can recognize uh, the return of the disaster. It's like a, a clock in the heavens, and their, their astronomy was so accurate that they were able to predict uh, this event thousands and thousands of years ago. Well, if, given that date in a 40-year window, uh, our butts are just about hanging out that window now. Our butts are right hanging out of that window now, and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and I do think that that we need to take seriously what the Maya had to say. But that it also involves responsibly studying exactly what the Maya did have to say. Uh, and that is a very complicated message, not an extremely yeah, simple so, uh, message. Yeah, so you got, this is about a 10-minute piece, end, uh, but uh, you day. got the uh, point, you got the point of uh, this piece right here. Now, you want to say something, Mark? Yeah. You had something to say? Uh, yeah, this is from the webpage TOT Hukan. Uh, underneath uh, religion, it says the religion of TOT Hukan was similar to those of the Mesoamerican cultures. Many of the same gods were worshipped, including the feathered serpent, the Aztecs Quetzalcoatl, and the rain god, the Aztecs Tialok, the dominant. Uh, civic architecture is the pyramid Uh, politics were based on the state religion religious leaders were the political leaders and uh, it's interesting to note that Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan means basically the same thing which means the feathered serpent right so now the, in the book of uh, Psalm, the 68th chapter, it speaks about the, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms, the 91st chapter, it speaks about the uh, angels coming down and their feathers, their hands. That's in Psalms 91, that's in uh, um, Isaiah, that's also in um, um, Psalms uh, 68. Okay, matter of fact, I believe that's in Psalm 68 and 13. Feathered serpent, and then it also speaks when Moses, when they went, left out of uh, Egypt, uh, the Most High instructed Moses to uh, build this brass serpent, and that serpent was uh, called uh, Nehushtan, which, which means brass serpent. And the ones that looked up to it, which were supposed to represent the Yahweh Shai, the, the, the uh, snakes and the serpents wouldn't bite them. But the ones that didn't look up got bitten. All right? Go ahead. Psalms chapter 68 verse. And let me say this, this right here, we're, this is this these uh classes that you these shows that you watch are for more uh scholarly Israelites. You know, not we're not focusing this focusing this on them guys that just want to hear what's called the white man the devil and all that. 
we're going this this is not the inter, this is not entertainment this is serious study so if the most high gave you that serious mind to get into serious topics well you in the right place okay I right, go ahead psalm 68:13 though you have lying among the pots yet shall you be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with gold with yellow gold yeah because like i said uh uh kukukan and kwatsukwatl means feathered serpent all right now if you go to the book of uh uh, Isaiah the sixth chapter, and start from the first verse. It tells you about the wings, and it tells you about the uh, seraphim and so forth. And the word seraphim means a serpent, a fiery flying serpent. Go ahead. It says uh, Isaiah chapter six verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the th a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each okay, it says above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto an, unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now read from the, uh, ser the, the, the word seraphim, seraphim come up. Yep. All right, go ahead. Uh, it says, uh, in, uh, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Now it said wings. Wings normally have feathers on it, right? Um, the word seraphim, and the brother's going to probably look it up, but I'm going to tell you what it means. The word seraphim means serpent or uh fiery flying serpent this was basically a shuttle shuttle ships sh groups of shuttle ships that came out of the so-called mothership which is a big ship and it mentions that when you read it down because the lord came out of the, the major ship so you had sh uh, so-called shuttle ships come down now when i went to mexico back in 87 i went to a museum called uh, uh museum museum of ant anthropology anthropology all right and they had a tour and they sh showed that what was the name of that city i forget the name of the city that they built where they founded mexico they still was a uh, prophet or a priest that said look when you see the eagle eating the uh the snake um that's where the city's going to be built and they built the city right there. That's where Mexico City. That was the, that was the uh, center of the rest of Mexico where Issachar um, uh, dwelt. So in Mexico City, they have a museum called uh, and it and was and, and it was open back in the I believe it was '64. I went there in '87. That's a famous museum. Now there's a section of that great city back before Esau came on the scene. And the tour guide said, look, Quetzalcoatl uh, uh, came down among his people and he taught him many things and he said he's going back into the heavens and when he left to go into heavens, he left in a spaceship and he said, he come, he said he's coming right back in a spaceship. All right? All right, go ahead. It says, and, it's, and above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled. Yeah, the, the, po the post of the door moving represented that ship coming down. Now that was similar to this movie, a scene, the, the opening scene of this movie called The Fifth Element. Remember when them beans came down and the ships came down and you heard that loud noise? Well, that was similar to that. Because Esau, like I said, Esau reads out this book. That's where he gets his ideas to make these uh, sci-fi movies. All right? Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now that's talking about the missiles, all right? Now, I'm going to show you one more clip. 
this is dealing with um, a Quetzalcoatl, which is um, supposed to be ha Yahweh Shai. That was Yahweh Shai when he came back. Now, they're going to show this. I'm going to show you this scene from this movie called Blood In, Blood Out. Now, you want to read that now or you want to wait until after the scene? Okay, I'll wait. Okay, we'll wait until after the scene. All right? Okay, ready, Yacht? Orale, mijo. This is Quetzalcoatl, the great Aztec poet king. That's, so that's supposed to be Yahweh Shai, but they made him look Mexican. They gave him a Mexican look. Let's go back to it again. Orale, mijo. This is Quetzalcoatl, the great Aztec poet king. He ruled the kingdom of Aslan, that was from Mexico all the way up here to Calipas. Calipas is the Americas. I'm going to teach you all about Aslan, because this vato's coming back someday to reclaim the Raza's kingdom. Yeah? Mm. Dad, I said, why do you put my initials on? Because you helped me, I say. We did it together, carnalito. Thank you. Hey. Oh. All right, so let's come back. Let's come back. Now, this is what I want you to go to. Go to the last, uh, I think it's the last tab where it goes into uh, Quetzalcoatl. That's Quetzalcoatl? Yeah. Okay, right. That's that's what I want you to get. All right, go ahead. Yep. Uh, yeah, this is a web page entitled, um, Was Mexico's God Quetzalcoatl uh, Jesus Christ? by Jean D. Matlock. Over 40 years ago, I discovered I, I could use linguistics to prove the Hindus... He goes into a lot of mess. Uh, yeah. uh, scroll down, there's a key point from this, this paragraph. Hold on, Bob. Yep. Okay, this right here. Right here. Okay, all right. Quetzalcoatl uh, himself wore a robe lined with crosses. The idols in the interiors of the temples where he was worshipped were crosses as well as the paintings on the wall. The Borgia Codex shows Quetzalcoatl and other humans crucified with him. I will just present in this article those of Quetzalcoatl and children. And, and you'll see the, the, um, the pictures, the Borgia, uh, Borgia Codex. The Bogier Codex was named after the Bogier family because they were the ones that commissioned uh, the conquistadors to come over here to the Americas. They were a part of the whole damn thing, man. And I'm going to say this as a footnote. If you got Showtime on cable uh, coming in uh, 2011, if this double makes it that far, they're going to have a series called the Bogiers. All right? And they're going to go deep into how, they really, how wicked they were as a family. All right? Is there more? That's it? All right. Now, I want you to get me uh this book is called They They Came Before Columbus, all right? It says the the African presence in ancient America. Ivan Van Sertima. Okay? And these people the, the head of the Olmec, the giant Olmec, that's a Canaanite right there because the Canaanites were commissioned and set up by Solomon to go back and forth to the Americas. Because Israel didn't go back and forth to Americas, but they knew that the Americas were here, but they had the Canaanites go back and forth, which were later called the uh, Syrophoenicians. And they were known for their uh, navigable skills and so forth. All right? Now, go to that point. All right, this is uh, chapter 5. So, you know, the, you know, the more we do these shows and bring out this truth, these Edomites can't mess with us, man. We have too much information in the Bible and different documents and so forth. And it's all coming together. And more people and more people are waking up to the fact that they're Israelites. All right? And more people are waking up to the, to the fact that who the so-called white man is, he's the Edomites. And more people are 
becoming more spiritual and trying to figure out this Bible. And they're stumbling. A lot of a lot of them people, they don't come out and tell you, but a lot of them people come on our sites, them Edomites and stuff, and they be watching our videos. All right, go ahead. This is uh, chapter 5 on page 73. It's called Among the Quetzalcoatls. The Quetzalcoatl of, of the Mexican Valley documents was never blonde or fair, as stated by the friars, but virtually always pictured as, a bla as black bearded and, and in illustrations had his face painted black. So that's plain, man. So now, like I said, the brother read that paragraph right there and it mentioned the uh, Bogier Codex. The Bogier family knew about the tribes being over here on this other side of the earth. And the Bogier family, we believe, is reincarnated uh, back as the, uh, uh, the Rothschilds. So if the Bogiers had that information back there, what do you think they know now? They know that we're the Israelites. They know that the Mosai is getting ready to raise us up, man. You got anything else, brother? Okay, okay, because we're going to close it out because we, we, we gave y'all, we don't want y'all to choke off this information. Go ahead. First Maccabees 3 and 48, and laid open the book of the law wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. And that's plain and to the point, all right? And I don't know if the brother has anything of importance, but if he doesn't, okay. Okay, it will probably be the next show, all right? But um, y'all brothers and sisters, brothers out there, and some of you serious sisters, the few of you serious sisters, you know, take heed to this knowledge, man, you know, because we're dead serious about this knowledge. And that's why you see so many videos. Out. You know, you got a lot of guys out there that make videos getting on other guys, and the woman looked like that, and she called me, and I tried to get with her. This is not, you, you can do all that bullshit, but we're going to give you straight knowledge, man. We're going to give you straight knowledge. Okay, you want to get serious knowledge? You, there's only one place to come to dealing with the nation of Israel. That's us. Not because we figured this thing out, but because Yahweh Ba'ashem Yahweh Shai gave us the spirit to figure this thing out. He gave us the this, this spirit to break these scriptures down. And like I said, we're that close to the end of this man's society. All right, so with that, I'm going to say shalom. Shalom.